A wonderful addition to the University of Lethbridge, Katharina Stevens. She's been here for about a year now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and the topic, of course, as you, most of you will know, is the Canadian government's new mandate for its summer job program grants, respectful of religious rights and freedoms of conscience. So, uh, Kat Stevens is an assistant professor at, of uh, philosophy at the University of Lethbridge, where she teaches legal philosophy and argumentation theory. She arrived in Southern Alberta last summer and is enjoying the city very much so far, except uh, I don't know how much she likes snow, though. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, I'd like you to give her a warm welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I even like the snow, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, so today, I'm going to speak about something that I'm not clear on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what the history is of this attestation, um, how it came about, what has happened since, um, and then I'm going to present you with some arguments that I came across, um, but I haven't completely made up my mind. I can see some arguments on one side, I can see some arguments on the other side. So basically what I'm hoping I'm going to do is um, provide the basis for then a very good discussion afterwards. Um, I think that it's even if you don't provide a definite opinion. If you provide, uh, closer to the mic, okay. If you provide arguments at all, um, that's always gonna be on the foil of who you are and what you believe in. So given that you're gonna listen to me, you have a right to know the following. I am very much pro-choice. I'm very much belief in LGD LGBTQ rights. And I'm not a religious person. None of this, I hope, impacted what I'm gonna say very much, but it's something that I think you have a right to know when you listen to me talk about these kinds of things. What will we be talking about? We will be talking about this. So the, <laughs> the Canadian government um, added an attestation to the application for the Canadian Summer Jobs Program. The Canadian Summer Jobs Program is supposed to support employers who are going to employ students and um, people from high school to do jobs, and that's supposed to get them a good entrance into their later life as professionals. And if you apply for this now, you have to click on the little attest button there, or if you send it in in paper copy, you have to check the little attest box. And the attestation contains um, the following phrase, both the job and my organization's core mandate respect individual human rights in Canada, including the values underlying the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as other rights. These include reproductive rights and the rights to be free from discrimination on the basis of sex, religion, race, national or ethnic origin, color, mental or physical disability, um, or sexual orientation, or gender identity or expression. So that's what you have to do. If you don't do that, then your application is void and it will not be processed. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem mostly um, because of reproductive rights. And reproductive rights includes, according to, sorry, um, according to the overview that the Canadian government provides on its website, includes the right to, say, um, to access to safe and legal abortion. Um, and this is what this whole issue is about. Why was this attestation added in the first place? It was added in the first place um, because the government became aware of the fact that some of the money from the summer jobs program um, went to uses that it considered um, intolerable. It considered them intolerable because these uses were meant to undermine abortion rights. So for example, um, the Center for Bioethical Reform got um, a roughly $55,000 and part of it went to printing posters to demonstrate against abortion rights. And also, um, but this I only read a few times, so I'm not willing to put my hand in the fire, it's not fake news. <laughs> um, because 
some of the money went to camps that then deni denied to hire people that identified as gay. And this the government wanted not to happen again. Um, so there's first, first there's two questions that we could ask ourselves, right? Why does the government think that abortion is a right? And why does the government take the route of including such an attestation? And I want to say a little bit about each of those. The right to have an abortion is not part of the constitutional law of Canada. So the constitutional law of Canada consists of the text of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights, and it consists of the case law that interprets the Constitution. Abortion became accessible widely in Canada through an important decision by the court it's called R. V. Morgenthaler. But in R. V. Morgenthaler, the court did not integrate a right to abortion into Canadian constitutional law. First of all, it's not clear how many judges in the opinions accept that there is such a right. Some of them seem to clearly do so, some of them might be doing so, some clearly don't. Um, so there is language that looks like these judges like it. Other judges don't like it, and other judges aren't completely clear. But in any case, it wasn't necessary to make the Morgenthaler decision in order to strike down the abortion laws as they were in Canada. And only things that are necessary for making the decision become binding afterwards as law. So anything that's not necessary for the specific decision that the court makes is not binding law afterwards. In addition to that, there were several opinions and no, no opinion was signed by more than two judges, which is also too little to make something binding law. And so there is no precedent in Canadian constitutional law that integrates the right to an abortion into constitutional law. But this doesn't mean necessarily that there is no right to abortion in Canadian law, as in law other than constitutional law, right? We can, lots of the rights that we, legal rights that we have are integrated into the law in other ways than by integrating them under the charter rights. And so for example, there have been decisions made by the Supreme Court um, against allowing a father to have an injunction against his wife having an abortion, in which the Supreme Court said that it doesn't recognize that fetuses have rights as persons, and that it can't find that either in the common law or in the civil law. And um, abortion clinics are considered hospitals because they provide necessary medical procedures. All these kinds of things show that there is a recognition in Canadian law that such a right exists. It's not a constitutional right, though. Arguably, we can say um, that this attestation further enshrines abortion rights into Canadian law, right? If you think about it in the way that whenever these rights are mentioned or used in order to make statutes or justify decisions, that kind of enshrines a right a little bit further into the law, even if it's not constitutional law, and putting it into the attestation does that a little step further. Now, why did the government um, oh, sorry. And you can see that um, the argument that there is no such thing as an abortion right because it's not part of the Constitution might, that I have found a little bit in my research, might not actually hit home as well as you might think. Because as you can see in the wording of the attestation, um, the government asks respect for individual human rights in Canada and then that includes the values underlying the Canadian Charter but also other rights. So it seems like there was some awareness that this, this, this right to abortion is not a constitutional right, but a right that is recognized in other ways. Um, you can also see this, this is again from, from the webpage that I showed you earlier where the Canadian government explains this, the whole application. Um, you can see again that these, the rights that they're speaking about are partially the ones that are core of Can Canada's foreign and domestic policies. And the policy is when you formulate a goal for your country or you put money into something. So this right, I think, I think the government thinks of this right as integrated into Canadian law in another way than through constitutional law. And that's why they think they can say that there is a right to abortion. Why did the government take the route of including this as an attestation, right? Why didn't they just simply refuse to fund organizations that they know will use the money to undermine abortion rights? They could have just said, we're not going to give grants to people that are going to print anti-abortion posters with it. Um, the problem is that they tried that and it failed. So when the government or when it became public knowledge or when um, 
how do you say this right? When people paid more attention to the usage of this money in this way, the government issued a statement saying that this was an oversight and it wouldn't happen again. And then in the next year, these organizations um, were denied funding. Uh, let me just find which ones. Ah, can the, the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, Guelph Right to Life and Toronto Right to Life, then sued the government over this. Because what the government basically had done is use, use a way to distinguish people who will get funding from people that don't get funding that wasn't specified beforehand in any part of the application. And this is why the government settled, right? The government settled, um, quote, because these organizations were denied funding on the basis of criteria neither set out in the application's guide nor included in the MP's list of local priorities in 2017. And the attestation is the attempt to add in exactly this thing that the lack of which forced them to settle. What was the first reaction to the attestation? This, right? It looks like the attestation asks you to say that you believe in abortion rights in order to get funding for summer jobs. And any organization that can't do this because they will get into an enormous conflict of conscience in saying that they respect these rights now felt that they can't apply for the summer jobs anymore. And that would have meant that you don't get for money for Bible camps, for example, or you don't get money for a Catholic-run soup kitchen, and so on and so on. And there are some very um, emotional stories. I think one of the stories I read was a woman who um, lets autistic, runs a camp where autistic children can ride on horses. And she felt now she can't hire the person she hires every summer to help with the camp anymore because she can't say that she respects abortion rights, so she wouldn't get the money. So that was the first reaction. The government then posted supplementary information. So it was basically um, an almost immediate recognition that you can't ask people to attest to their beliefs in order to apply for this. And so they tried to say what they mean by the important words here. And the important words here are core mandate and respect, right? If you say your core mandate has to respect something, that sounds like you have to say your organization accepts this belief as at least true or as a reasonable one to hold. So the government said, when you say core mandate to us, what we will understand is primary under activities undertaken by the organization. And when you say respect to us, what we will hear is we do not seek to remove or actively undermine these existing rights. That was what the definition of these words was supposed to be from now on. And then in addition, they gave examples, right? Um, so for example, look at example two. A faith-based organization with anti-abortion beliefs applies for funding to hire students to serve meals to the homeless. The organization provides numerous programs in support of their community. The students would be responsible for me meal planning, buying groceries, serving meals, etc. This organization is eligible to apply. So it's not about your beliefs, you're not attesting that you have certain beliefs, you attest that your primary activities do or do not do something. I just filled it in for you. I kind of tried, I tried a little translation, right? Because it now go, if you fill in these definitions, it sounds very different than it sounds when you read the attestation as it's on its face. On its face, it says, both the job and my organization's commented respect these rights, which includes abortion rights. But if you fill in the definitions, it reads, both the job and the organization's primary activities do not seek to remove or actively undermine these rights, which is much easier to sign than the first one on its face. However, um, statements from the Catholic Church or from representatives of the Catholic Church make it pretty clear that this is not, this adding this in was not enough. And so now I kind of want to look at a few arguments back and forth. What is the problem if it's about beliefs? What's the problem about if it's about activities? What kinds of arguments can we deal with? So if the government had actually meant to require an attestation of what you believe in order to apply for grants to fund your summer jobs, that would have been at the very least disrespectful of freedom of conscience and by extension of religious rights because religion is about conscience, at least as I understand it. As an, I'm sorry, as an outsider a little bit. <laughs> um, 
right? We can all, everybody can immediately see what the problem is if the government asks you to say that you believe in something in order to be able to get money in order to do something that has nothing to do with it whatsoever. But presumably, that's not what the government was trying to do. Still, we can say that governmental suppression of unloved opinions is a big problem. And it seems to be part of the government's purpose, right? If you look down there, it says, the objective of the change is to prevent Government of Canada funding from flowing to organizations whose mandates or projects may not respect individual human rights, the values underlying the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and associated law. And now comes the important sentence. This helps prevent youth as young as 15 years of age from being exposed to employment within organizations that may promote positions that are contrary to the values enshrined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Associated Case Law. So that sounds very much like we do not want our children to hear these opinions or arguments for these opinions. And that is still a problem, even if it doesn't ask you to attest to certain beliefs, it's still a problem if the government says we're going to suppress certain opinions because we don't like them. People always say it's the liberal government that does this, but really, if you want to know why this is a problem, you want to turn to liberal thinkers and they will tell you why. So in John, John Stuart Mill, for example, um, denies any right to the government to control public opinion, even in order to preserve what is officially and publicly acknowledged as the truth, normative or descriptive truth, right? So John Stuart Mill thinks there is nothing but bad coming from the government suppressing certain opinions. And this is because um, it is evident in itself, as any amount of argument can make it, that ages are no more infallible than individuals. So whole societies make mistakes. Every age having held many opinions which subsequent ages are deemed not only false but absurd, and it is as certain that many opinions now general will be rejected in future ages as it is that many once general are rejected in the present. So Mill's idea is if we start suppressing opinions, we're going to suppress the progress of argument, and that's a bad thing. The government has absolutely no right in doing this. That's an argument against this. However, Mill's critique was aimed at government coercion, that is against criminalizing stating certain opinions, right? This is basically underlying our freedom of speech and expression. Generally, however, what to fund is part of the government's prerogative. We have to think about it as a funding thing, right? It's about where we're going to put money into. Um, and that this is the case is, is, for example, can be found in case law. So the Supreme Court decided a case called Canadian Arab Federation versus the Minister of Citizenship. And what happened here was that, um, thank you. What happened here was that an organization that provided um, English, English te teaching skills, English, te sorry, English lessons, 10 minutes and I'm getting nervous. That <laughs> <laughs> provided English lessons to immigrants had made statements that were anti-Semitic and seemed to kind of smell like they endorsed terrorism. And the government then refused to further fund those lessons. And um, that organization sued, and the Supreme Court answered by saying that it's the government's prerogative to fund, and if they don't like what you say, they don't have to give you any more money. You have freedom of expression, but, the government, but you don't have a right that the government gives you money to further your opinions. That's basically what it was. Nonetheless, you see me going back and forth, back and forth. You're kind of following my thought process here. Nonetheless, a moral problem might persist, right? So Brian Bird, I found, has argued this. Um, even though you might argue that no one is automatically entitled to public funds, when the government offers up public funds for a specific purpose, then it has to make that offer in a manner that is not discriminatory and that respects the fundamental freedoms of Canadians. If money is there to introduce students to the, to the world of professional jobs, right, then the way that you give that money out shouldn't depend on whether or not people do what you like with it. First of all, I want to say that I think this argument is very very convincing when it's about an attestation of belief. It seems to be wholly unfair to give money out for a certain purpose and then to tell organizations that the only way that they can get the money is if they believe what the government would like them to believe. 
But what about if it's in reference to activities, right? What if the government decides to add in a clause that says we're just specifying the purpose for which this money is supposed to be further? It's supposed to be for jobs for students, but not these kinds of jobs for students, which is what it tries to do here, or claims to try to do here. Theoretically, I'm pretty sure we can all agree that public opinion should be influenced by good arguments only, not by money, not by how much time you get to speak, not by whether or not you're wearing nice clothes. The, th the way that people should form their opinion should be through arguments. And that means that it's always morally problematic if any powerful organization puts money behind certain opinions but not put money against others. The problem is that I'm not entirely clear on whether or not we could possibly create a world in which the government and other powerful uh, organizations don't influence public opinion through things <clears throat> like money or how much, how much time they give people to speak and so on. Right? Just think about school curricula. The government has to set school curricula and that will inf inform how public opinion is formed. I'm not sure that this can be avoided. In addition to that, funding has been allocated by the government before in all kinds of directions, right? Funding gets cut for women's rights organizations, and then funding is allocated only if you don't promote um, pro-life positions. This is something that the government does all the time. I'm not here by saying that it's not problematic and that we shouldn't think about it. I'm just trying to show that now, if we're at this point, the issue seems to be much less big than it seemed to be before. Here's another line of argument, right? So we went all the way down as far as I could go, that line of argument. Now I'm going down another one. Maybe the clarification doesn't really remove the requirement to attest belief. Maybe it's really not enough to say, when you say this to me, you will mean that, even though you don't think that's what it means. And I think there are two arguments that you can make, right? First of all, it counts what something means in common language. If I ask you to say to me, I hate my mother, and then I say, by mother you will mean chocolate, and by hate you mean, will mean like, that might not necessarily make it that much easier for you to say, I hate my mother. Or it might not make it easy enough for you to say, I hate my mother, because it counts what something means to you. And it might be a justifiable position to say, when you ask me to say that my core mandate respects abortion rights, and you say that that just means that my primary activities don't undermine them, that might be fine for you, but in my conscience, I'm still saying I'm respecting abortion rights. I think that that argument has some merit. I'm not entirely sure how strong it really is. The other argument I found on the website um, TGC, and it was made by Diana Warren, and I'm not sure I understand it, so if you can help me afterwards, um, that would be great. The argument goes like this. The government fails to realize that for churches and faith-based organizations, there are no activities apart from belief. A core mandate ceases to be a core mandate when it's extracted from the entirety of belief. The belief is what spurs on activity. It is an outworking of belief. So I think, and I might very well be wrong, that the argument here is that even if you ask someone just to attest to their main activities, to ask them to take that apart from what their core beliefs are is really asking a little bit too much. There is no such thing as attesting to certain activities without also attesting to belief. I can follow this argument this far. I can understand that what we do comes out of what we believe. Anything that I do comes out of what I believe to be true and what I believe to be right. And asking me to stop doing things that I think are right or to do things that I think are wrong is hard on me. And part, of religious, and part of what religious rights has accomplished in Canada and also in constitutional law is right not to make people do things that they believe are wrong. For example, not to wear hard hats if that means you can't also wear a turban at the same time. What I'm not sure is whether to say what you have to attest is that your soup kitchen doesn't actively undermine a great, I'm almost done that your soup kitchen doesn't actively undermine abortion rights, right? Saying that seems to me not necessarily mean to say, you have to say that you don't believe that abortion rights are the wrong way to go. I'm not sure whether this connection actually exists. I was trying to make this clear to myself by asking myself, if I was, hor if I was an animal rights advocate and the government asked me to attest that my primary activities does not include breaking 
into animal testing facilities and letting every animal out, would that make me feel as if I say that my beliefs for animal rights are not really there anymore? And I don't think it would. But again, I'm really not sure that I understand this argument correctly. And if there's someone in the room who can explain it to me better, this is just what I try to make of it. This is the end. I haven't given you an answer. <laughs> this is because I'm trying to work out what I think the answer should be. I hope this gives some kind of platform on which we can have a discussion. And the last thing that I want to say is, what do you think? <laughs>